everyone and welcome to episode three of Property Investing Podcast brought to you by Real Estate Investor. I'm Dennis Wong and thank you for joining me for another episode filled with great content. In this podcast, I'll be talking about cash flow positive properties. As a strategy, there'll be a property update by Dr. Nicola Powell from the Domain Group and also some useful information for those investors looking at renovations. So let's get straight into this episode. And the first thing I'll cover is cash flow properties. For those new to investing, when you hear the term cash flow positive properties, this essentially means the property is generating enough rental income to cover all the ongoing expenses, such as council rates, insurance, property management fees, repairs, and loan repayments before tax and depreciation benefits are factored in. The property essentially pays for itself and as an investor, you don't need to put in any extra funds to cover the ongoing expenses. Now rental yield is a measure of how much cash an investment property produces each year as a percentage of the property's value. Now rental yield is calculated as a gross percentage before expenses are factor it, factored in, uh, whereas net percentage uh, is with costs included. Now, there are a couple of different options to consider when trying to find a cash flow positive property. One option is searching in suburbs with high rental yields. Now, this suggests the suburb has good demand and landlords are able to increase rents due to that demand. Now, you can actually download our free highest yielding suburb reports uh, from our suburb performance reports section on our website. Another option is to buy properties that are at least 20 to 40% below the median price for the suburb. Securing a property at a cheaper rate means that your loan's gonna be smaller and so your interest repayments are less. Another option that uh, investors looking at cash flow uh, target are multiple income properties, such as duplexes or properties with a granny flat, where you have two incomes coming in. Dual living properties are also a great option where you have two dwellings within the one house. Now, these ones generally will have a separate entrance to each dwelling. There's two lots of rent, but one set of expenses. Another option is targeting holiday accommodation. That's also a viable option. Now these generally can have higher returns because you can charge night by night or week by week, but the risk is higher as you may have long terms of vacancy in off peak periods. Uh, A good example is having a property by the beach um, and during winter, there obviously is gonna be less demand. Now the final option uh, could be renovations. That's another strategy. You know, finding a rundown property to add value will give you the opportunity to increase rents. And depending on the floor plan, you may even be able to add an extra room or change a study to another bedroom, giving you the ability to increase rents further. Now, like any strategy, there are pros and cons. So it's important to consider these and whether this strategy will suit your personal situation. The pros of a cash flow strategy include having an extra monthly income stream. I mean, who wouldn't want an asset that generates good income? You know, the more cash flow properties you purchase will allow you to one day replace your own salary. How good would that be? Now, having cash flow positive properties allow you to use the extra cash to cover the shortfall that may exist with another property that's in your portfolio. Perhaps that property is you purchased as more for capital growth is negatively geared. So having cash flow positive properties in your portfolio will allow you to then use that cash to pay for those shortfalls. Now, having cash flow positive properties also increases your serviceability and it will definitely make you more attractive to lenders. Now, believe it or not, there are cons of having cash flow positive properties. Not many, but a couple that I wanna highlight um, include paying more tax. I mean, the income generated is taxable and you'll need to include it as part of your tax return. So it's something that you need to uh, consider. Also, uh, cash flow positive properties are often associated with lower levels of capital growth over the longer term. So even though the property is providing you with great cash, your property isn't going to be appreciating in value. And this is where property investors will get the best returns for their investment. Now, James Lawrence from our marketing team has a great saying that you may have heard before or seen in one of our blogs in that capital growth is going to make you wealthy over time, but cash flow is the oxygen you need to get there. There are those properties that will give you both cash flow and capital growth, but they can be very difficult to find. So it's important that you do all the necessary research to see whether an investment property can deliver you both or ensure you have a balanced portfolio where you have some properties with capital growth and others with cash flow.
Now, we recently had Dr. Nicola Powell, data scientist from the domain group, join us to provide a property market update. She provided us with an update on what's happening with house and unit prices across the major markets. So if you missed it, here's a quick snippet of Dr. Powell's update. So let's have a look at house prices uh, across our major capital cities. Sydney, um, highest price uh, city, we all know that. Um, prices keep rising um, in Sydney. We had a little bit of a month by month correction, but you have to think it's a bit of a volatile time of year in terms of the fact that, you know, you have that seasonality effect. Um, but the median price is still above a million dollars and we've had many um, experts um, uh, and pundits saying that the median price of Sydney will drop below a million dollars. It hasn't yet um, and, um, you know, it, it, it is staying over that million dollar mark. Melbourne really has been following in Sydney's tailwind. It's the second most expensive market um, and we really have seen improvements in that Melbourne market. So let's start to have a look at that um, growth across all of those markets. So this chart actually documents the year-on-year -year growth, which is in green across all of our major markets, and the quarter-on-quarter -quarter growth, uh, which is obviously smaller, um, in, the, in the navy blue for all of our capital cities. So, I'll quickly and briefly uh, talk about all of these different markets. So Sydney, for example, as I said, prices continue to rise. Um, despite the new price record, um, the growth rate actually is halved compared to the previous levels um, of growth that have been recorded. So actually what I mean by that is, is the amount of growth we're seeing quarter on quarter is starting to ease. Melbourne is a heated market for buyers um, and investors. It recorded the strongest annual price growth of all of the capital cities. I mean, 15% um, year on year, it, it beat Sydney. And that's what I mean by, you know, Melbourne really has been in Sydney's tailwind. The thing with Melbourne, it's really had consistent um, growth over the last four years and a consistent rise in prices. You know, I always use the phrase with Melbourne, it's the powerhouse of population growth um, and that's really one of those major factors that's been driving um, that housing market forward um, in Melbourne you know and the same with Sydney you know population growth has been strongest in both Melbourne and Sydney and we know people moving from um, overseas tend to choose Sydney or Melbourne as their place to reside and Melbourne you know it, it, in terms of the birth rate as well is also booming uh, in Melbourne which has added um, to that obviously the, the demand and the upsize market and fueling that market forward. Brisbane um, is certainly one of the more price competitive housing markets, really great for those who are actually looking for an entry level investment property. Um, and, you know, prices over the quarter actually re recorded a, a quarterly de decline, so prices are actually um, correcting over the quarter. Adelaide, um, Adelaide really is a resilient housing market. What they've seen in Adelaide is, you know, it's probably one of the more modest um, annual growths and quarterly growths when you compare it across the other capital cities. Um, but this, what comes with a steady growth is it's obviously more sustainable. Um, it is, again, one of our more affordable markets, so again, presents opportunities uh, for buyers. Canberra. Canberra's been an interesting one for the housing market. Um, Canberra really is reactive to what happens in the, uh, the public sector. You know, we are known as um, uh, the government uh, city. We are becoming less, or Canberra is becoming less reliant um, on the government sector. And, um, you know, I think it's about 40%, whereas um, years ago it was much higher than that. So 40% reliance on that public sector. But the thing with Canberra is it's had and experienced a uh, chronic lack of land supply um, over the years. And that's really one of the things that's really been driving our market forward, uh, driving the Canberra market forward. Over the last couple of years, it's really made significant gains. Before that, it was really stagnant, so it's really been playing catch-up, and that's why we're seeing um, such a strong price growth. So Perth, um, declining market, um, the only market that recorded yearly and quarterly decline. Perth has been recovering from the resources boom. Slowly, um, it is gaining um, a, a stability um, in terms of that decline. You know, the level of decline, it certainly isn't as high as what we had seen. Um, and it is considered to be coming to the end of its actual property cycle. 
you know, Perth, we know that the reasons, one of the reasons why, or one of the major reasons, I should say, why it's declining is it is recovering from that resources boom. Hobart, definitely one of the more affordable cities in terms, if we flip back to, to the prices, you know, when you have a look at that, that uh, price point over that March quarter, um, it was just over 380000 When you compare that to other markets, it, it, it's significantly more affordable. The thing with Hobart is that it has had strong growth. And when you look at that level of growth, it really is rivaling uh, Sydney and Melbourne, a year-on-year -year growth of 10, just over 10%. And so Darwin, uh, the, the, the last market on our list, um, houses are showing signs of a recovery because we did see that quarter on, on quarter uh, growth, but year on year is still recording a decline. So now on to the unit market. So the unit market does include unit units and apartments, so it's meant to high rise uh, development, and I should say houses actually include townhouses as well. So again, this is the same graph looking at those median prices um, across um, all of our major capital cities. And in some markets, what we're actually seeing are units are actually in a different growth cycle uh, to houses. Largely, that is because of that building boom, which I've said a number of times, which I will go on to in the last few slides. So let's have a look at those price movements, which ha what's happening in the actual um, unit market. So as you can see, um, Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart are the only cities to record both an annual and quarterly decline, uh, sorry, qu quarterly growth, not a decline, quarterly growth um, in Sydney, Melbourne and Hobart, only cities to record uh, both an annual or quarterly growth. I notice I don't have the percentage changes there, but when we uh, uh, have this online, I'll make sure those are actually added to this slide. All the other markets are actually showing a downturn, so they're showing a downward trend um, in their, their annual um, uh, uh, growth. Um, now this is largely due, due to the extensive unit developments. Next on today's podcast, I'd like to uh, cover renovations. Uh, renovating property is a great strategy that can provide you and your property many benefits such as increasing the value of your property and the ability to increase your rent allowing you to improve your cash flow. The biggest risk with renovating is overcapitalizing so you want to ensure you find the right property at the right price. Now overcapitalizing is when you spend too much on the renovations and the total costs are going to be higher than what the property is going to be revalued at. Also something to be aware of, especially when it comes to your tax deductibility and cash flow, is knowing the difference between a repair, maintenance, and capital improvements. A repair is when something is restored to its original state, and it's usually a partial, uh, such as repairing a fence by uh, replacing three palings that have deteriorated, or perhaps replacing part of the guttering that was damaged from a storm. Maintenance is work to prevent deterioration or to fix existing deterioration. And this can include painting or maintaining plumbing. Now you can claim an income tax deduction for costs related to any repairs or maintenance on your rental property in the year that you pay for them. Now for capital improvements, these are things that you cannot claim a deduction for. Capital improvements is where something new is in installed or provided. It's generally is different to the character of the item that has been improved and it actually goes beyond just restoring the efficient functioning of the property. So capital improvements include things such as remodeling the bathroom, uh, installing new timber floors where it was previously carpets, and even replacing a fibro walk with a brick wall. So these items need to be claimed as capital works deductions and they may be claimed over a number of years. So I thought I'd just point that out given it is tax time and we're talking about renovations because it's really important to understand the differences so you can claim the expenses correctly. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome back uh, James Lawrence who heads up our marketing team as uh, he has been renovating an investment property over the past couple of weeks. So welcome back, James. Thanks, Dennis. Great to be back on the show. Uh, look, it's great to have you on given that uh, you're currently doing some renovation work. So firstly, I guess... You know, what kind of renovations are, are you currently doing at the moment? Yeah, I'm doing a cosmetic renovation of a, 
uh, an investment property that I own in the suburb of Palm Beach. Okay. Which and is on the Gold Coast. Yeah. And have you owned that property for a while now? Or? I have actually. I've owned it for pro- approximately, just coming up 10 years actually. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and it's always been tenanted, um, given it's, you know, it has a good location. Yeah. Um, but the, the, the previous tenant, he was in there for six years yep. and he let us know he was planning to move out. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we had the opportunity, you know, when the property became vacant to, to do some cosmetic renovations to improve the, the quality of the property and, and improve the rental return too. So when you purchased it 10 years ago, did you do any renovation work at all at that time? No, not at the time. I didn't need it. But um, though over, over the years, it had become you know, tired and we were doing increasingly more sort of maintenance and, re- and repairs each yep. year. So we just took the view that now is the time to bite the bullet, yep. put a decent budget towards the cosmetic renovations and, and do it all at once while it was vacant. Perfect. And, and was this your first renovation project? It was really, other than um, I've done some cosmetic stuff around the house recently because we're, we're thinking about, that in terms of my PPR, because yep. we're thinking about perhaps um, renting that one out to and moving elsewhere. Okay, yep. Um, and we talked about um, granny flats on a previous episode, so I did some basic cosmetic stuff to that recently. But yep. in terms of you know, what, what we've done on this reno, yes, it's the first kind of large style project that yep. we've undertaken. Fantastic. Yeah. And I guess a really important question, did you budget? Yes, we did budget actually. Um, and you know, to do this, we actually downloaded the Real Estate Investor Renovation Budget Calculator, yep. which is available as a, as a free download on the website. So yep. that's a good place to start. And that enabled us to put in all of our you know, estimates for all the, you know, the labor and the and all the... Materials, materials and, yeah, yeah. My mind went blank. Yep. Materials, the labour, and everything we're going to need to, com- to complete the renovation. Yeah, and then the the calculator <clears throat> enables us to you know, track the actuals against our estimates yep. and the resulting variance, so we can keep the, the budget on track. Yeah, look, I actually use that calculator myself as well. Um, we did a couple of cosmetic renovations on existing properties, and the calculator, yeah, definitely helped us really. Uh, allow us to focus on the numbers and make sure that we weren't spending too much. So um, I guess as part of that that process, James, did you also allow for some extra funds for any like unforeseen costs? Yes, I did, Dennis. So we had an overall budget for our estimated cost of the uh, you know, labour and materials and then a, a contingency fund, which is you know, particularly important if you're doing things like replacing kitchens, bathrooms, because you never know what you're going to find when you rip stuff out and there may be mm. extra repairs that you hadn't foreseen, which actually, you know, we we came across that problem ourselves. So Yeah, yeah, that's right. Sometimes uh, you're not going to be able to uh, predict what's underneath those tiles that you rip out. There could be a lot of mould that you need to get rid of or could be holes or pipes that need to be replaced. So that, That's right. We actually had to completely replace uh, you know, a whole cupboard which had become rotten because it was adjoining the bathroom and... So um, that took up some of our contingency fund. But um, yeah, definitely important to, to do that, have a set aside some extra cash. And uh, did you do any of the work yourself? I did actually. I, um, we saved on some labor by uh, removing the old kitchen. Okay, yep. Um, which. Just a sledgehammer and sledgehammer just smash it out. And smash it up, <laughs> which is. Um, no, no fun in a way, I suppose. Yep. And no, it didn't take long if, if you have a few of you doing that. And, it's, yep. um, and that saved on some costs there. And the only other thing I've really done is some of the painting, um, which again, no, saved on, saved on cost. I mean, I think it's only a small unit, no two bedrooms, living area, yep. kitchen, bathroom, laundry. Yep. But I think, uh, an estimated quote. I think you had a, a quote for a similar size property done recently. I'd be probably looking at you no, know, maybe five. Five thousand. Yeah, yeah. So mine was a little bit big, uh, a little bit bigger property. Um, it was two bedroom, but it had an extra study. Uh, there was two bathrooms as well. So 
that was just under five thousand dollars to do yeah. all that. So I was thinking, yeah, around that mark. So the fact that I've managed to save that cash by doing some painting. Mm, yep. I actually quite fairly quite enjoy painting. You know, when when you sit at a computer all day if your job is yep. sometimes nice to do something different and it yep. appeals to my O C D getting those <laughs> getting those yep. cutting in lines dead straight. <laughs> so um yeah, I did so yeah, we did that's the only work I've really done is okay. some of the labour and, and some painting. And so there is work that you would recommend outsourcing then? Oh absolutely. So um I mean just to go through very quickly what what the cosmetic renovations were, we replaced bathroom, kitchen, yep, yep. flooring, ceiling fans, yes, and fresh coat of paint. Okay, so yep. this is probably something that some of our audience can relate to. Yep. It's fairly typical, and you know, we got help with um, installing the kitchen. Yes, um, all the tiling in the bathroom. Yep. Obviously, all the plumbing and the electrical work. Electrical work, I assume. Yep, yep. Don't want to muck about with that. No, you don't want to do that. <laughs> um, and yeah, obviously, the electrician to install the lights. Yeah, okay. So, um, and the ceiling fans. Yeah, and the ceiling fans. Yeah. So, again, I think it's something we mentioned in the last episode. It's good that you do have a, a reliable team of people mm-hmm. that you can call upon to help you with projects like this. Yeah, and I think as well, when you're, when you're first starting out, it's always good to get at least uh, three quotes because then yeah. you can really um, determine whether or not your first, second quotes are on par with each other or whether one's just completely too expensive. So um, definitely, yeah, worth um, doing, even though it can take time because I know some tradies, and I've gone through this, don't respond to, in a timely manner. Yeah. So, um, yeah, but if you can get get them on the phone at least and, and try and get a rough quote, that will at least give you an idea. Um, so I guess in all, in, all, in all the work so far to, to date, what's, what, what have you found to be the, your biggest challenge um, it's probably just like the project management side of it, trying to line and line up the help and the trade so, yeah. so they're all in on the days you need them. Yep. Because as we all know that you no know, holding costs every day that's vacant is essentially costing you money. Yep. That's not rented. So yep. that was probably the biggest challenge and you know, if you are let down by trades then trying to find uh, a replacement. Replacement, yeah. And as it's a smaller job, you no know, trades quite rightly might not want to do the work if they've got larger more lucrative jobs yep they've, they've also got got lined up so yep. that's really the, the, been the biggest challenge mm-hmm. um yeah the, the project management side of it yeah and and did you do any research before the renovations uh to see what your property would potentially be worth after the work was completed i, I did yes and um uh, being a being a real estate investor team member obviously i use the uh the, the platform that's yep. available through our pro membership. Mm-hmm. So I use the My Value and the, and the My Research tool to check um, estimated market value of similar properties that, yep. that had been renovated. But given I'm not planning on selling this property, more, more importantly for me, it was checking recent comparable rentals to see what, what potential rent we could achieve once we completed the work yeah so so what is the difference in the rent I guess what were you getting before with your previous tenant and, and what do you think you could be able to rent it out for after you finish the work um, we're probably looking at about a 50% increase on wow yeah so yep. that's based on we it's only a small block of four units and um, the guy that owns the upstairs unit we, we, we know him by the body corp yep and he done a reno and he told us what he's now achieving yep and uh, we spoke to our you know, rental agency and they gave us a, a similar amount so yep. I think that's kind of ballpark and then via checking my value my research again that's you know, within within like a 20 or 30 dollar range yep. of what of what we're expecting yep. is what came back as well on those comparable rentals so yeah to get a 50% increase obviously that's going to be good for cash flow and yep. it's kind of well worth all the hard work hopefully yeah. that we've put into it <laughs> Now, I don't want to count my chickens because we haven't actually got anyone. Yeah, rented, tenanted yet? Not yet, yeah. but you know, the photos will hopefully be done this weekend and then, yep. and then time will tell. Well, you actually you, you mentioned something there that actually um, I'm quite interested in. So you mentioned that you, you knew the guy upstairs through your body corporate. Mm. So did, given that you're, you're renovating a unit, did you have to check with the body corporate before you did any yeah, renovations? We, we did. We at the at the last meeting, we, we brought up and 
tell people we're planning doing the, the body court, but we weren't going to break any of the, of the bylaws. Um, and it's more in case of no courtesy, just to let people yep. know there's going to be a little bit of noise on yeah. one or two days when we remove the, the bathroom. So it's just keeping people informed. Who, yeah. You know, so you know, we, we know all the other owners and the other tenants, yeah. so it's just being courteous I suppose it is yeah look I found that too communication is really important um, you know I did a similar thing I just notified people in the body corporate I wasn't doing any changes outside of the unit so I didn't have to get approval um, and then I think on the um, the weekend before the work was started or the trades were starting to come in I put a sign just sticky tape the sign up on the uh, the common door just to let people just as a reminder just to let people know that there's going to be yeah. work happening so it's nice to be done yeah I think most of the tenants there found it quite courteous you know yeah. I, don't, I don't want complaints coming through or you know work no. being halted because someone wasn't no. happy about the driveway being blocked or something like that no. although I did get in trouble from one of the other owners because I neglected to turn off one of the common taps properly and it's oh. dripping and I actually told me off but not turning off the tap so well I, you learn from your mistakes James so next time that's right and I so I apologise and made sure I tighten that tap a little bit oh, tighter that's next time that's good yeah so, um, so well, well, look I guess the, uh, the whole process what did you most enjoy about about renovating I think that you know, seeing all the all the hard work come to fruition given that we're pretty much nearly finished now has been pleasing um, I think other than that, when we get somewhere and it's rented and we can see the improved cash flow we're going to get as a result, that's yep. going to be you know, the, the most enjoyable thing. Yeah. And so I guess you, you, you will do another renovation in the future if the opportunity uh, pops itself uh, up for you? I think I will now. Having done one and you know, learned from a few mistakes along the way, I, I feel that you know, we've got the skills and the and the project management and the and the budget and the, the team of people we could call upon to, to definitely do another one. So yeah, I think I will and having access to all the, the data from the from the real estate Vestar platform will help yep. too in terms of you know, finding those discounted properties that below the suburb medium price. Yeah. That may that do have the good bones but may be cosmetically distressed that yep. you can add value to. Um, I think yeah, I think I will, Dennis. Fantastic. Yeah. So look, guys, I guess um, James and I will probably will do now is just sum up is probably just uh, point out some common mistakes that you should avoid. So especially those that are just uh, uh, looking at their first renovation. Um, I guess the, the first thing is, you know, really not, you know, number thing you should do is really research the property and, and understand the suburb fundamentals. So that is really, really important if you are renovating for a profit, whether you're looking at holding and, and, or selling, um, understanding what the price ceiling is for that market is, um, you know, not paying too much. Is there a demand for that type of property? You know, making sure the demographic suits the property type that you're looking at renovating. So if you're buying a four bed, two bath house, um, then obviously your, your, your target market's probably gonna be a growing family or an established family. So you wanna make sure that there are families uh, of that nature that uh, uh, are wanting to, to move to that area. So. You know, the, the pro membership tools will give you access to be able to do those numbers. You can quickly work out price ranges, median price, price ceilings, um, and you can even get access to photos as well at, you know, other properties that have been renovated in the area. And that will give you an idea on, on what, what's, what's possible, especially if it's uh, very similar to your target property. Yeah, that's a good tip, Dennis, to do all that and check what's in vogue in terms of uh, the potential ideas that, in terms of the start of the renovation, so. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, yeah, another mistake that we kind of briefly touched upon is underestimating the cost of the, the renovation. So it is really easy to underestimate the, the costs involved. And if your budget does blow out, then every extra dollar will eat into your mm. profit margin. So I think instead of having an overall ballpark, you, you know, it's really important to break your budget down into the fine detail. Um, so... If you are like purchasing a, a property to renovate, obviously the, the purchase price with you know, deposit and don't forget to budget for you know, the holding costs or the ongoing interest payments, which yeah, that's right. neglect to, to include, you know, and then include stamp duty insurances, etc. And then you know, the added cost for the improvements broken down by item and the category that, that, they, that will sit within. So broadly speaking, you know, labor, so this could include the purchase 
price of the property if you're if you're going out to buy a property to renovate with the deposit and importantly the ongoing interest payments which yep. some people ne- neglect to for, forget to include yep. and then plus stamp duty insurance etc yep and then the cost for the actual improvements to the property broken down via item and the overall category that they all sit within so i mean broadly speaking you could break that down you know, either by room perhaps or mm. break it down by you no know, parts and labor just making sure that it's it's all accurately itemized so you do have a an accurate budget that you, that you can work towards. Yeah. And again, just a quick reminder, a good starting point there is our renovation budget calculator. It's a free download, an Excel file, but it's, it can really help you if you're planning on doing a reno soon. Yeah, and you can, you can customize that as well. So um, uh, I guess the next point I probably want to raise is just ignoring your target market. So it's really important that you understand and you're aware of the demographics of the suburb that you're going to be renovating within. Um, you know, is it going to be a young family? Is it uh, single people? You know, you need to make sure that the improvements, <clears throat> excuse me, that you make are going to suit your target market and it's not going to be uh, financially out of their reach. There's, I mean, there's no point in, you know, renovating um, all high end uh, fixtures and, and having a classy decor if your target market's not going to be able to afford that, you really want to be appealing to the larger pool of buyers in that area. Um, obviously, then reducing the risk of your property being tenanted or, or, or not being um, able to sell it um, if you're cornering yourself into a very small niche of the market. Yeah, that's a, that's a good tip. Um, and kind of along those lines, I guess, is something you mentioned right at the top, you know, the risk of overcapitalizing. Yeah. Just be aware that there's going to be a price ceiling within your location or your suburb, and you're not going to be able to add unlimited value. There's, there will be a limit to what the market will pay for your newly improved mm-hmm. renovated property, so be aware of that. Make sure you do your comparable market analysis in terms of recent sales, recent rentals, or what current similar properties are on the market for, so you can get an accurate valuation estimate. Um, and to help negate that risk of overcapitalizing. Yeah, that's right. And don't forget, you know, you're, you're, it's, you're renovating for profit. So, you know, don't buy the most expensive toilet or the, you know, tap fixtures, you know, based off your own taste. It's really, you know, you're going to be renting it out. Um, you know, sometimes cheapest will, will do. Um, so, yeah, that will obviously help you uh, reduce that risk of um, overcapitalizing. Um, so, look, probably the next thing is, you know, trying to do all the work yourself is something that um, is a really good tip um, you know unless you've got the skills and you know like James touched on time um, then you know don't be tempted to do all the work yourself you know sometimes it is better just to hire a qualified professional where they're you know the, the standard of finish is much higher much more professional and the end product's going to look look much better um, you know even though you may save um, some money in labor costs if you stuff up the, the job or it doesn't look as professional as you'd hope, it may even cost you more money, but also more time to then get a professional back in to fix the work that you've just done. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree with that. And you know, get yeah, get multiple quotes so you know that what you're paying is you no know, ballpark figure. Yeah. You can get you know, um, testimonials of people they've been yeah. quite for before. That, yep. Don't be afraid to ask for that. Um, and make sure you ask uh, whether they've got insurance too. Very, very yeah, important. Good point. Um, um, yeah, and put a, put a cost on your time. Now we're all busy people, um, so yeah, don't 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 necessarily think you're going to save money if you're going to do the work yourself because there is a cost to your time and you need to factor that in. Yeah, that's right. So like you know, you might save in uh, labour costs, but it might take you three months to do what a professional would do in one month. So then again, like what you touched on before, James, about um, the holding costs, you know, in those extra two months that's taken you to do it, you've lost rent there, you've paid more probably in rates, insurance, interest repayments as well. So there's a lot more than uh, costs involved in just saving on labor costs um, in in getting a uh, professional to do it. Absolutely. Um, I think another mistake some people make, if you're planning on doing a structural renovation and, and you know, potentially adding rooms um, you know, bef- before you make that decision perhaps consider how you could use the existing space and maybe mm. remodel um, 
a property which you know, can change the layout and make it feel more spacious at a fraction of the cost of yep. you know, extending or, or you know, building up or building out. So, I mean, a few examples, you know, removing walls and remodeling. Um, you can create mezzanine levels. Yep. You can combine rooms to create more of an open plan living. Yep. Um, and then simple tricks like improving the lighting or you know, the color of the paint can you know, make a dramatic um, change and atmosphere to a room so mm. sometimes small things can make a big difference yeah or even you know if you've got a garage that's probably not used maybe your target market is students they take public transport you could always change the garage into an extra room mm. actually yeah we, we we did that on our ppr actually we turned the garage into a like a media room mm. and then and then built a another garage yep on like the driveway yeah perfect so you know, as a room that so that's been beneficial for yeah. us. So it's amazing what you can do with a little bit of imagination, Dennis. Yeah. Yeah, well, look, and, and I guess as part of, you know, in building on, on the existing space, you know, don't ignore the outdoor space as well. So especially if you have a house, you know, having a, um, a, a tidy garden or, you know, a nice street appeal can actually add significant value uh, or perception of value to your property. So, you know, make sure that you, you know, leave some money aside as part of your renovation budget if, you know, you have, you know, some outdoor space or, or entertainment area to make it, um, you know, appealing to potential buyers or, or tenants. Yeah, good point. Um, so some landscaping, like mm. you said, street appeal, adding in, you know, adding a new fence or painting existing fencing. Yep. Small, small changes can dramatically change the perspective of potential buyers of renters on the property correct yeah um i think the next thing you touched on as well james is um you know budgeting for unexpected uh, issues so you know there's like like i mentioned earlier you know you're not going to find uh, you're not going to know that there's mold until you remove those tiles or remove that cabinet um uh, during the renovation so you need to make sure that you've got a contingency uh, fund or uh, money set aside uh, just in case that uh, you need some extra work done that was out of the original scope. Yeah, and that's right. And if you do have unexpected issues, don't ignore them. No, just treat them as part of, part of the project, fix mm. them, and and they try and work out uh, an effective scenario for a you know, good solution yeah. using, using skilled trades people where appropriate. Yeah. And it's going to happen, you know, no matter how much planning you do, you're going to find something unexpected pop up. So, um, you know, don't be surprised, but, you know, just 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 plan for it and and you'll, you'll get through it. You know, you've got a team around you, you'll have tradies there that perhaps might be able to help you. So just, uh, just treat it as another, another step that you just need to get through and you'll be able to move on. Absolutely. What was that? The quote, the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's true right? yeah. particularly when it comes to property you know, yeah. there's so many variables in property investing and you, and you can't control all of them so concentrate on things you can control them and then where where issues do crop up just you know, put a good, good solution in place to fix them yeah um, yeah and look in doing that you know make sure that you're not cutting corners too when you're fixing these unexpected issues um, so make sure that it's not a band-aid fix and, and it is you're going to be put, doing something that's going to rectify the actual issue because you don't want to have to go and redo it later on um, it'll cost you more in materials labor as well and you know obviously at the end of the day it's your profit margin that's going to be affected so you know yeah. make sure you do the job right the first time and you're not going to have issues later on yeah no botch jobs in other words <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> oh you got some zingers today james <laughs> um and lastly i guess um given the rise of popularity with you no know, renovating TV shows. Mm -hmm. Yep. And no, they're a good watch, but no, don't confuse TV with with reality. Yeah, very good, very good point. Um, don't be lulled into a false sense of security because of how you no know, renovating uh, uh, sometimes betrayed on on TV shows. It can be challenging, so you no, know, keep that in mind and don't think it's all going to be you no know, glamorous. You're going to necessarily achieve huge huge profits. Make mm. sure you do your research and, and plan the renovation well. Uh, and you, you know, they, they can become very profitable for you, but yep. make sure you, you keep a good um, idea of, of reality and perspective when you carry out the work. Yeah, make, make sure you're, you're realistic. You know, I mean, some of these profits that you see on TV, 
you know, they've obviously got the media and, you know, the TV show um, support behind it, which obviously gets more people interested. So, you know, there are, there are renovations that I've seen where, you know, they can, you can get good profit back as well, but it's just making sure that you do your research and you're buying the right property at the right time um, and you're doing all the, all the things right when it comes to the renovations. So, um, so hopefully, guys, that's been useful. Thank you very much, James, for joining me. On, oh, pleasure. Yeah, uh, giving us fun. some of your experience and tips on, on your recent renovation. And I look forward to seeing some of those uh, pictures once you've finished. Yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll post them. And um, yeah, like I said, I'll pro- probably do another one soon. So maybe Dan's will team up and do a, like a, a joint reno. Yeah, yeah. Well, we yeah, might even, know. yeah. That, actually, that, uh, that sounds quite interesting. So mm. it's just a matter of finding that property and, and then we can get straight into it. Yeah, so, we will. Um, so guys, if you'd like any more information on some of those uh, points that we talked about, uh, there is a great blog that James has written. Uh, just go to blog.realestateinvestor.com.au. You can click on uh, the renovation tag. We've got a lot of great content on there. Um, and there is an article there called 10 Mistakes to Avoid When Renovating for Profit that you can have a look at. So jump on uh, line and you'll be able to get more information. Well, thank you so much for tuning into episode three. Thank you again to James Lawrence for joining us and sharing his renovations experience. Make sure you visit our blog at blog.realestateinvestor.com.au as we have lots of great content to help any renovators that are listening. And if you'd like to hear more from Dr. Nicola Powell, uh, the webinar recording for that is also available on our blog. Now, if you are ever having trouble finding the right property, don't forget we have free consultations that can help. Please click on the banner ad at the top of the page and you can talk to one of our senior property strategists to see if we can help. So look, I hope you can tune into our next podcast where a special guest, not James, will be joining me to talk about subdividing as a strategy. I'll talk about how strata titling can help investors generate equity and also very important, eight key changes from the federal budget that all property buyers and investors should be aware of. So until our next episode, happy investing and I'll catch you next time.